What up, YouTube? I am your host, Mediocre Tutorials and Reviews, back in here with one more video. All right, guys, much different video today, but I got time today, so I wanted to go through it. You guys have relentlessly sent the content of Shahrazad Ali over to me over the last year. You've wanted me to react to it. So that's what we're going to do here today. Now, a couple of things before we get into this. Her book, The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman, was released in 1990. Okay. The interview that we're about to go over was recorded in 1991. I was but a wee lad at the time. I was five, six, around there. For those that ear hustle on the channel, I think it's time to put on your objectivity hats. I think it's time to take away emotions out of a conversation and let's just listen to what she has to say and then make judgments after. Without further ado, The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman. The number one bestseller of 1990 is the most talked about, the most popular, and the most written about book Black America has ever seen. Newspapers across the country had a field day. Every editor, every publication, and every writer eagerly sunk their teeth into the meatiest topic they had ever encountered. Personal relationship problems of black men and black women. The Black Man's Guide is discussed from the pulpit, debated in seminars, examined in college, and argued about on street corners. Never in African American history has a document surfaced that forces every black person to look outward and inward. Reactions run the gamut from praise and gratitude to hostility and outrage. The educated bulk at its lack of scholarship and standard documentation, while the general masses of the people say they are grateful for its straight talk and uncomplicated descriptions of what slavery has done to black women in America. Whatever the reaction, whatever the opinion, it is clear to every Negro, black, or African American that Shahrazad Ali is the black man's new champion. This woman is on a mission. Her strength, her guts, and her unstoppable energy to single-handedly defend and uplift black men has never been witnessed before on this continent. Black men report that the book has re-energized them to become better husbands and fathers, and has given them a new sense of worth and brotherhood with each other. And yes, I have charged that our educational class has failed us. They have not represented our needs. All they got was a job. I gave them 30 years to present us with a program, a national project, an agenda that we could work on to improve our homes, and it never did arrive. The only thing they gave us was a welfare program, and we know that that failed. Mm. The reason that I wrote the book, certainly, which is a classic question that I'm asked all over the country, I wrote the book because we represent the missing link as black women. The black uh, man has been dissected, examined, the white man, the white woman, and the black child. But it has been us as black women who have never been examined. We have been protected. We have been insulated. We have been kept from any kind of criticism about our personal behavior in the home and outside of the home. And we have been given the false compliment that we are the backbone of the black nation. We have been protected regarding our behavior. Guys, also too, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I'm going to try to not keep on reacting and pausing it. I want you guys to listen. I want you to take it in. So much sparse reactions because I want you to understand the words that she's saying. Also, in thinking through this, also think through what is similar or dissimilar, dissimilar regarding the State of the Union today. That's interesting to keep in mind. Let's continue. There is no doubt in any community in this country that the men in those communities are the backbone of their nations. There is no doubt in the white community that the white man is the backbone of his nation. The European, the Buddhist, the Korean, the Japanese, the Hispanic, all of those men are the backbones of their community and there's no doubt about it. It is only in the black community where those values have been transposed and where they put that burden on us and tell us that we are the backbone of the black community, which is a direct insult to the black man and implies that he don't have no backbone and that his women have to represent him. It's a heavy burden. It's one we are tired of carrying and it is one that is not true. I remind people all the time that God did not make the white man, the white woman, the black woman, and then the black man. He made the black man first and he created all the rest of the people out there. When I wrote my first book back in 1985, I was going about the country trying to still work to teach our people something, trying to get them to stop eating pork. And uh, at that time, I was having what I call get off those halls lectures. And uh, I would take the microscope out, and I would show black people how even if you cook pork, you couldn't kill the worm. I would show them that uh, the worm was still alive in the meat after heat, because that's what they told us, that you could cook it and kill the worm. And so I would show them what it did to the brain and the spinal column. And so there were many black men who wanted to stop eating pork. They wanted to change their diets, and uh, they were in agreement. But it was the black woman who I found who was the most adamant, 
who refused to change their cooking habits, who didn't want to shop differently, who didn't want to do any different meal planning. And so I say, well now, if we are refusing to provide the black man with the proper physical food when we know food is what sustains life, then what else are we keeping from him? What else are we doing to destroy our men, to destroy our families, because we don't know any better or because we're too lazy or because nobody has ever called on us to repent? And so then that led me to the study. And so as I was going along initially, I was keeping up with names and addresses and all of those things for that so-called research that they talk about. And then I found out that we didn't have a control group. There was not one set of Negroes that I could point at and say, well, these particular Negroes over here, they didn't suffer from the psychological trauma of slavery, so we don't have to deal with that. I found out that all of us had the same problems and that we were not as different as we think we are. Mm. We are all doing the same things. We're all practicing the same patterns of behavior. A pattern is something that people follow because they think it's the right way to go. We have been doing it and approving that behavior between each other because we think, well, this is just how you do it. We have not represented our own ideas. We have not had anyone to represent our own ideas to us. The only place we have learned about how to be a woman or how a man is to be a man is on television. Mm. We haven't had that kind of chance to study ourselves. The white woman has been the only woman we have had an opportunity to study every day of our life. On television, in every magazine we ever picked up, in every newspaper, on every radio, she's been the only model we have had. And if we think that that's not important, then we need to, you know, look at that again. We have studied that and we have made up and came up with requirements that the white people have set for us for our man. And if he cannot come up to those requirements, then we have decided that he is impotent and unable to be our man because he's disqualified, because he does not qualify by the standards that the white people have set up. Woo! We think a good, successful relationship is one where everything goes our way. The first time it stops going our way, then we got a serious problem. We want our man to do everything we tell him to do, but we don't want to do anything he tells us to do. Yeah, it's hard language. And all of our so-called educated class together have never come up with an agenda that brought the people together to try to improve their condition like the black man's guy. Guys, uh, just real quick. Um, whoa. <laughs> just real quick. This was 30 years ago. 30 years ago. 30 years ago, and even uttering the things that she's uttering today would get serious backlash. Okay? So think about her and her position 30 years ago and the kind of backlash that that was. Now, this is pre-internet, right? So it didn't get probably the widespread ears that it would have gotten today. So she didn't get all of the backlash or all of the praise that she would have today. But still, though, this is 30 years ago. Earth was way different, much different. Let's move on. Not one of them have ever had a program that got all of the black people talking, got all of them out. Made everybody decide to make a comment, whether they wanted to or not. People are compelled to testify all over the country. I can't walk the street. <laughs> See, we, we've never been examined, as I said, in the, the breakdown of every relationship, each party in the relationship shares one half the responsibility. That's 50% of the responsibility. Mm. So yes, the black man is 50% responsible for the breakdown of our relationships. Mm -hmm. And we are the other 50% half responsible for the breakdown of our relationships. And I ask black women, if you do not want to accept 50% of the responsibility, what percentage do you accept, and how does that behavior manifest? And I guarantee you it's already in my book. <laughs> because this lists the things that we do. We've just never seen it in print. Just, oh man, I, I, so I love what she's saying in the 50-50, and that, um, you know, essentially, it, she's not um, relinquishing fault from the man. She's just putting a magnifying glass on women because what she's saying is that they've not been examined. They've not been checked. They haven't had to atone for bad behaviors that she has seen. And I think that is key because that's what I try to do on this channel is I'm not saying oh, we are not accountable at all. <laughs> there's there's some shitty dudes out there. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You know, there is at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, it's just a, it's a shitty human thing. It's a, it's a human thing. And if we place accountability on everyone except for ourselves, then to a point, no one will come up the victor. Okay, let's keep going. We've never had it out front. We've never been busted. 
But now we have the equality we've been crying for. They're busted and so are we. I teach that slavery tampered with nature. When I say that slavery tampered with nature, I mean that a major rite of passage for every male mammal is to provide and protect for a female and her young. Now certainly we know that the black man has been denied that opportunity. Mm. He has not been allowed to qualify to protect his woman or provide from them, for them. They have told us that the only provision that the black man is qualified to give us is one of money. And we have made finance the major uh, focus of our relationships with them. We have made the one thing that most of them don't even have be the criteria. We have been taught that if they do not give us money, that we are not to even allow them to be a father to their child. We have been taught that if he does not give us money, then he is not qualified to tell us what to do. We have been taught that if he does not give us money, that he doesn't have any rights in the home. It's whoever is making the money who has the rights. That's not our system. The black... What, what's interesting here is that she's talking about what has been taught. Um, and often what I hear now and the things that I've talked about as well is that um, it's not so much taught as it is evolutionary biology that drives hypergamy. But it's interesting to see her perspective. Let's keep going. Black man provides more in a black home than just financial support. He provides direction guidance, gratification, fulfillment, and discipline for our children. Those are the principles that are missing in our home today, which is why our children are savage in the streets. We see those children out there sometimes acting wild and uncivilized and disrespectful because they don't respect anyone because we didn't teach them any respect. We didn't know how. And a lot of times we look at them and we say, yeah, they're out there doing this. And we act like that they drop down out of the sky. But those are our children. We birthed them up out of our womb. You know, that made me think about, um, you know, com the, the, the old trope. And, you know, I still see parents do it today. I, honestly, I see mostly mothers do it today. Um, when the kid does something and, oh, he's so bad. And then the oh, so bad is kind of like popularized uh, right like and they put up Instagram stories about it and you know point a finger at it like no maybe he's just a kid and maybe he just needs some discipline uh, or maybe that right like and, and why is this bad thing that you look at as something that he's doing is like a positive trait you understand what I'm saying but there begins the lack of discipline way early on let's keep going they belong to us and we are responsible for them. And for every child that's out there out of control, disrespectful, ignorant, and uneducated, they have a black mother somewhere who failed to do her job and a black father who failed to do his. It is not the responsibility, it is not the responsibility of the American government to raise our children. It is not the responsibility of the American government to support our women. <laughs> and it certainly is not the responsibility of the American government to hold our man down. What I'm getting out of this is that what she's um, putting forth is that the American government has um, removed the man out of the household, has emasculated the man um, through efforts such as systematic oppression, um, and instead the government is seen as the provider and the protector for the woman. So what I'm getting from this so far. Let's keep going. This book is to allow us to have a new chance to start all over and say, yes, this is what has happened. I didn't make myself like this. We don't get anything from ourselves. We pick it all up externally. And as we have picked up these bad habits, we can you know, decide that we are not going to do them. See, what has happened is that we have been turned sisters into kind of like Frankenstein. I think everybody remembers the Frankenstein monster. He had somebody's arms, uh, somebody's legs. He even had somebody else's brain inside of his skull. Oh, he was functional but he was not himself. And so, yes, we are functional. We have been taught that having a good job means that we are a total success. We have been taught that the solution to all the problems of the black people in America is to get a job with the white people. That's just not the truth. And that's certainly not saying that it is not important for us to have money for food, clothing, and shelter. 
And it's not saying that we as black women are not strong. I'm here today to represent some of that monumental strength we say we have. But this does not mean that we are not strong. We don't have to put our man down in order to be strong. That's how you demonstrate your strength. I'm just saying strength. that we have used our strength in the wrong direction. We've been Ooh. using it against our man instead of for him. If we oh. use the kind of strength and influence that we have in this society to support the black man, won't anybody be able to come against him? But every man is judged by his woman, and if his woman say he ain't nothing, then the whole world believes he ain't nothing. The actual fact is, every man himself judge him, his own self by his woman. He can be out in the world being great and the whole world can be kneeling to him. And if he come home and she say, you ain't nothing, you ain't been nothing, then that's who he believes. Mm. And yes, we have insulted our man in front of our children. It wasn't intentional. We just been frustrated. We couldn't make you brothers do what we want you to do. We didn't have anybody else to tell sometimes. So we would say it over the children. He ain't no good. He make me sick. He's stupid. If he loved you, he would be here with you. When every man in here know that his relationship with his children is predicated on his relationship with their mother, and if they are not getting along with us, they are not going to spend any time with the children. That's just how that is. And I've talked to brothers around this country, and I have testimonies and tons of letters from brothers who write and tell me that my book made them to decide to try to be a man again and try to have a woman. Now, if you think that's not an important work, I got black men who write me and say, you have made me decide not to have another white woman. I'm going to try to get back with the sisters and try them one more time. <laughs> See, you know, nobody is going to give us this information. Uh, they, they have us standing around sometime and pointing at the brothers and saying, yeah, that's them over there. They ain't no good. They doing this and that and the other, and it's all negative. And they have us thinking that the black man is going to die and we going to live on. But that's not how it's going to go. Mm. There is still one monolith in the black community, and that's that it still takes a man and a woman to make a baby. So if the black man dies, we all die. And I don't want to die. I want to live. I want my children and my grandchildren and whatever else is coming after Shara's out, I want that to live. But we are not on the path of life. We're on the path of destruction. You know, learning how to, to get along has to be taught by force. Slavery was taught by force. We didn't volunteer for that. They made us do that. They forced us to do that. And that's how we're going to have to learn how to reunify. It's going to have to be done by force. Oh. We're going to have to make ourselves try to deal with each other. Oh, I see. <laughs> and, and that's very difficult. And it certainly takes a great deal of self-control and love for your nation at large. It's the greatest form of unselfishness. I think the comparison to slavery there, I was, I was like, oh, she is radical. <laughs> She's gonna, well, was that what she was teaching? Was the force? You know what I mean? I, that's that's not the method I do. I, I bring people to the table. I let them sit right here. Let's have a conversation about something so we can have a better understanding. I heard force in the slavery analogy. I'm like, oh, it's a bit militant. It's what it is though. Let's keep going. Now, I don't go around advocating that people that hate each other stay together. That's not what I'm saying. That's different. We can't solve a problem or get to a solution about a problem that we refuse to acknowledge that we have. We don't have to be ashamed this, that we have a problem. I say this all day. We don't have to be ashamed to know that it is related to slavery. And you have to focus on the all right of our problem. Because problems are related to slavery. And I know that that seems to be some old hat issue and, and everybody want me to stop talking about that. Uh, nobody would tell the Japanese woman to forget about the fact that during World War II, the white man interned her family, took all of their personal possessions. Nobody would tell her to forget about that. Uh, nobody would tell the Indian woman, forget about the fact that the white man came over here and took your country and put you and your babies out on the reservation. And nobody would dare to tell the Jewish woman to forget about the Holocaust, so why I gotta forget about slavery? <laughs> this is so early 90s. See, the Japanese and the Indian and the Jewish woman got behind their men, and they had some very terrible histories also. But because they got behind their men and supported them and worked with them, those people are successful today. They own property. They have businesses. They got great land. 
here and abroad. You know, they have stocks, bonds, whatever America has to offer, they own part of that. They are in a position to make decisions because they have some ownership. It's only been the black man and the black woman who didn't reunite after a terrible time. And so today we are splintered. We don't mm. have very much. We practice envy and jealousy. Mm. You know, they taught us a lot of bad habits that we practice against each other. Mm. If we practice everything we practice against each other, against the white man, they'd have been killed out of America. <laughs> Most of that stuff we reserve for our own kind. And that's wrong. We have uh, had Crab that moment that we, we are the backbone of the black nation because it has served to make us think we were better than the black man. Mm. We have walked around and, and wore that as some kind of a sacred garment. And our men have had to struggle up under the already preconceived notion that they wasn't no good. We have always heard that the black man leaves us. He walks out on us. He don't love his children. He won't take care of his family. He beat his women. He do a lot of horrible things. This book goes back to try to examine what are some of the possible contributing causes. What happened before he left? Mm. What happened? Something happened. The black man is just not bad by nature. Mm. The brothers love their children as much as any other man. Every man loves his baby. They keep wanting to tell us that our man don't even love his children. Listen, I, I don't know what's in the book per se, but I love what she's doing because it's it's what I try to do, a component of what I try to do in the channel in a sense that uh, we're here to critically think, right? We're, we're here to push beyond the surface level of understanding of a particular topic because I think like what hits a lot of our eyes is the surface level, right? Like, and not kind of what goes into it or a challenging of the surface level because it's not deemed admissible to challenge that surface level. Such as, what's the topic that we did like a month ago? Oh, uh, the Tory Lanes. why don't bl uh, black men protect black women? And I've had live streams and bringing people on and had them talk through, you know, how, how does this manifest within your life? Uh, but like from an anecdotal perspective. And then we went back and we looked at the data and, and time and time again, it's normalized domestic violence figures. You, you understand what I'm saying? So it's just like certain things could be feel good to say. But when you really challenge these ideas and you step back and you try to look at some examples from an anecdotal perspective or even some, some statistics on it, right? Then it becomes less of your truth and perhaps someone else's truth. But then there's a lot of factors at play which inhibit that growth and that progression. But let's keep going. He's not a mother though, he's a father. He's not gonna have the same kind of connection to the cub that we have. We can't expect that. We keep wanting the man to act like a woman. He can't act like no woman, praise be to Allah. I wrote the book so that the brothers would understand what's going on because most of what we charge them with is that he can't quote handle us. He can't handle me. Mm. They haven't known what they were handling. What's going on they back didn't then have too? That information. <laughs> The book is really a book that puts the black man on point because it tells him what he is allowed to happen to his woman and his children. And he can never again say he didn't know what was going on because I have told him. <laughs> See, it's never been an issue about whether or not the book is true or not, brother. The issue has been that I was not supposed to tell. Ooh. But that's the missing information. <clears throat> And I was willing to come out here and go through whatever was going to be required if it was going to reunite some of our people. If we can get one or two black families in every town to start functioning differently, to make a better man and a better woman, then this campaign is worth it. Mm, it's a legacy. It's worth it for our entire nation. I didn't just donate money to Marva Collins School because this is my hometown or because I wanted to put it in my mother's name. But we must have our own black students to educate our own children. We have to educate our own children. If it's in a closet, I would rather support them to have my own kind, trying to teach my own kind, than sending them out there into the white people's school and let them tell them all kind of nonsense that they want to. Yeah. 
it, it, it's a very serious situation. Uh, let us take a look at what we as black women have produced while we were allegedly backboning the black nation. One in every four black males between the age of 20 and 29 is in prison, on parole, been arrested, or had some bump with the law. Over 50% of our prison population is black, male, growing, and female. We have more black men in prison than in college. Six out of every 10 black men between the ages of 15 and 44 are unemployed, in jail, got some disease, homosexual, on drugs. The jail versus college one is not true today. I don't know. I'm not sure about back then. 73% of all the black men in prison were raised by a single black woman in a home with no man. 80% of that 73% suffered child abuse in the home, victimized by the mother. One third of our children drop out of school before they graduate. Over 60% of our households are headed by black women who are single, divorced, separated, or widowed. Yeah, we got a serious more problem. And only God knows how many of our black babies we have killed through abortion. I don't think that's something the black, I think that's something the black man will never understand how we kill that life in our womb because we decide we don't feel like taking care of it. It's too much of a hassle. Or we change our mind about how we feel about the man. So we have been in a very, very powerful position. We can make heaven or hell for the man and we can decide who's gonna live and die. That is a great woman, I agree. But we are in a very prestigious position. We are the wives of the man who was the first man that God chose to be on the earth. That's a very great position. The most valued and the strongest man on the earth that everybody's trying to use for something. He's the most durable. He's the most persistent. He's the most determined. The black man is not wrong because he does not do what white America wants him to do. And he's not wrong because he don't do what we want him to do. We don't know everything to do ourselves. We learning a lot of what we think that we're supposed to do through recommendation and chance. Passing information among each other. Sharing secrets that'll help us to trick him, to keep him confused. Echo chamber. We do things in front of his face and we have learned how to convince him that he didn't even see that happen. Ha, gaslighter. <laughs> Just serious situations. This is the first platform black man has ever had to air his grievances about the black woman because nobody would ever listen to him. They listen to us. Mm. We have had many complaints. Many of them may be true, but they have complaints against us too. They've just been too cool to deal with it like that. Mm. And then God sent Sister Sharaza. I said, we're going to deal with it now. History can't be complete without dealing with it. It's... it's mind-boggling to me um, that the need of a woman to help women understand components of these arguments but it seems like this is her legacy like like this is what she was put here to do was try to mend relationships between a black man and a black woman I mean that just seems like she is passionate about it we cannot let the history live and die and record that we were all right and they were all wrong because that's just not the way it is. We are good people, but we are, go are both going to be a good people. And I hear, you know, women around the country tell me, say, well, you have insulted black womanhood and now anybody from any foreign country or anybody who picks your book up is going to think that all black women are like that. That's impossible. Everything I list in the book is visual and audible. You can see it or you can hear it. So if you don't see it or hear it, it ain't there. Yeah, it yeah, don't have it. But if you see it and hear it, which you will, it, it's present. So there's no danger that somebody's going to look at one of us and think we are doing the things that I describe in the book. Because you can see if somebody's doing that or not. That, that's, that's not difficult to be able to read a person on that. The book certainly does not give the black man any rights over us in a certain kind of a way because no man can begin to try to get us together until he look at himself in the book. See, we represent problem number two. They already know who problem number one is. Now, I know that many of us uh, 
have heard a lot about, allegedly, as I said, about how much money I'm supposed to be making. I have to mention that because that's what they mention in all of the newspapers around the country. It's, it's the weirdest thing I ever heard of. Uh, one article in Emerge magazine before I left, day before yesterday, I come out of Boston, I went back to Philadelphia, and, and somebody had faxed me a copy of an article out of a uh, Emerge Facts. magazine. Ew. And the magazine said that they were still getting letters about my book but that they had decided not to print anything else about it because they had decided that my book had made enough money. <laughs> so I called editors up. I say, I told my secretary, I said, get him on the telephone. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, uh, uh, that was a very ridiculous and ignorant remark to make, brother, since you don't know what the book sells for or how many I've sold any of that. I say, plus, why don't some of you black people get together and go tell IBM and Adidas and Nike and Reebok that they made enough money? The argument is so ridiculous. That, that's what she was talking about before, the crab in a barrel mentality. You have editors of magazines that, irrespective of the content that you're putting out and the value of it, that wants to stop the sale of the book because she's made enough money? Oh, that just boggles my mind. So you're not going to let free market take place. The, the, you're not going to let economics take place because it has made too much money oh my god like that's just that's just ridiculous to, ridiculous to me as a content creator i feel her pain if you create something that's of value well then let the market decide don't have people trying to pull you down because they feel like we've you, know, you reached the limit on how much that you should be making off of your work it's ridiculous to me okay let's move on see what they say. I have security, uh, mostly, not because of black women. We ain't gonna do nothing but fuss. You know, I have security because of black men. The book puts the black man on point. They get hysterical, they go into denial, they jump the seats, charge down the aisles, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so it's not the black woman that this book like is my comment because section. many of our black men don't want to take responsibility for their families. Many of them... Uh, not just because of financial reasons, many of them have accepted so much of the hype in the medias that they, they don't know what it would be like to be in charge. They got doubt. They have fear. They are afraid that they will fail. Mm. We are all afraid of failure. The major tool that was used against us during slavery was the uh, implication of fear. We have to get past that fear. Our men have to stop being scared to say, yes, I'm the head of the house. They need to know that every woman want to know her limitations with her man. Mm. Any woman that can do a man any kind of way and have her way with him and say anything she want to him, she ain't going to want him in a minute. We have to know what the black line is. I had a, uh, uh, did an interview the other day from a newspaper out of uh, Baltimore. Anyway, so they had brought down the camera crew and stuff, and so they were trying to interview me. So, of course, they got on that favorite part of the book, you know, that everybody deal with. And so uh, he asked me, had a, I, I haven't been slapped in the mouth. What? So, so I told him, I say, well, uh, this book is not an autobiography, first of all. I said, and uh, secondly, I said, I don't get that far out of control. I say, since that's how it's described, it's very easy to keep that from happening. Just don't do that. So I said, I don't do that. I don't talk like that. I said, I can tell by his tone of voice when it's time to stop talking. What? Is she saying that there's a component of her book that is telling a man to slap a uh, woman if she, if her behavior is crazy? Is that what she's saying? Is that what she's saying? <laughs> I do not advocate domestic violence. Let me make that abundantly clear before this video returns. The views represented in this video represent hers, unless I say about out my own mouth. Okay. Let's move on. That, that's the most amazing thing. <coughs> amazing thing to me is how our people go around the country trying to pretend that we ain't fight. <laughs> and that I made that up. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, as I said, this book demonstrates that, that we are not as different as we like to think that we are. 
So what I'm going to go over real brief right now is what the attributes are of the good black woman. Since she's not on television, we may not recognize her. Okay. <laughs> now, the good black woman has seven attributes, and then I'm going to explain to you how to utilize those in your day-to-day -day life. Come on. The good black her. woman has self-discipline, courteousness, oh. cheerfulness, self-respect, intelligence, cleanliness, and love. Now, we've heard those, that terminology. You know, it's like one of those where they tell you, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. What do that mean? You know, how, how can I make that functional in my day-to-day -day life to benefit me as a practice? It mm. sounds like all theory. Where is the practicum? What do I do? Mm -hmm. The good black woman has self-discipline. That's self-control. Let me make that real for you, sisters. We can start with our mouth. The good black woman can control her mouth. The man, too. She don't have to say everything that comes up. Yeah, that's It's true. okay if he <laughs> get the last word sometime. <laughs> you know what's interesting? So when she, when she uh, set up the kind of the seven things and what she said ahead of that is that we're really not dissimilar. Everything that she, well, most of the things that she mentioned in the seven, I, you know, I think men need those things as well. I, it, it's, so there's not a lot of difference between the two genders of what she's mentioning, but there are some things that I would add on for a man um, and probably take away from that seven as well. So, but let's keep going. You know, she don't cuss in public. And she works on not cussing in private. She don't tear a man down with a mouth because they can't out argue us. Can't nobody out argue us. Don't want to. I don't want to. I have charged that we nag our men too much. We keep our men's head tied up so much with our petty grievances about our personal relationship that he don't have time to think and plan for our future. Because mm. he got to deal with what's going to happen the with us every time. day. You know, it's, uh. it's real odd. When the black man come home, he almost have to do a wind test or stick his toe in the door. He don't know what's waiting. <laughs> he don't know who in there today. Emotions. not be so vicious with our mouth. You know, men are not petty like that. They're not going to out-argue us. And it has been proven that verbal abuse is just as harmful as physical abuse. So let's not use our mouth to do that to him. The good black woman is courteous. She says, thank you, baby. I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate every effort you make. Try harder. I'm going to work with you. Thank you. I know you did your best. Now, that's a whole new language. <laughs> but just to say that during the course of the day, every day, with the man that you're trying to be with or want to be with will make our life easier. We can't get it if we don't give it. We keep wanting them to give us and do something for us that we refuse to do and give to them. It don't work like that. The good black woman has self-respect. She don't have to go out naked just to get the attention of a man. Mm. I have sisters all over the country and they, and they come up to me uh, after the lectures and they'll be talking to me and they'll say, well, you know, uh, all he think about is sex. All he think about is my body. I said, why don't you show him something else? <laughs> and then here's the really good one. They'll come up and they'll have on uh, uh, a weave. They have on false eyelashes, another whole face, false fingernails, and all of that. And then they'll say, but I'm looking for a real man. <laughs> She nagging you know, him in the audience, relax. <laughs> can pull a dress down without thinking that it devalues her. She doesn't have to use her body because she has so many other good attributes about herself to get the attention of a man. Thanks. Thanks. We can take the sisters, the sisters in a position to take all of the charge 
uh, and sexual energy out of the black community by just dressing differently. We have the power and control over that. That don't stop you from being beautiful. Hmm. That don't stop you from getting a man. Let me just let, let me try to make this relevant for 2020 um, and beyond is what it appears because social media is not going going to go away. If I meet a young lady and I'm looking at her Instagram and it's full of nothing but selfie posts, if it's full of nothing but um, I, right, her story is just you know part, parts of her body always creep into the stories or the feed posts or what, or what have you. In my mind, I'm going to devalue where I would place you in that dating economic marketplace. Like, yeah, I still may want the viscosity, but most likely I will not consider you for future because you're 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 dating the Internet, right? Like you're, you're seeking the validation and uh, and and you're advertising um, yourself for others in um, a way that removes self-respect. You see what I'm saying? So. Um, but, yeah, this is 30 years ago. Crazy. And it certainly puts things on the right perspective so some other judgments can be made other than physical. Don't take no knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to have a sexual reaction. That's the most base. We spend less time doing that than anything else we do. So, you know, that doesn't always have to be the forefront issue. We know we are capable of that. The good black woman has intelligence meaning that she knows how to behave properly in the streets. She's not in the wrong place. Some of our women don't know what else to do other than go to the bar. They need some activities. Some of our women thinking that staying home on the weekend is some kind of sin. Some of our women think that if they don't have a new outfit to wear every day that they gonna self-destruct. You know, we, we have a lot of just that kind of nonsense going. Uh, every time we buy new outfits and clothes or whatever, all we're doing is sending money out of our community. We don't own no clothing store. If the white man closed the shoe factory, we'd all be here barefooted tonight. We don't own no shoe factories. You know, very base things that we don't own that we put our money into and demand we have to have them. A lot of times our men look at us and know that he ain't never going to be able to make enough money to give us all of the things we say we want. And don't no man want to be with no woman who he constantly got to deny her the things that she says she want. And that represents failure to him, to have to always, you know, not be able to provide us with what we ask for. Keeping up with the Joneses. One of the ways we can do that is to start being satisfied with less. You know, the good black woman is clean. Now that's Before she get into cleanliness, um, being satisfied with less, she is speaking truths. Complete and utter bars. Complete and utter bars. Okay? No one wants to be with anybody where they feel like they cannot meet their standards. This kind of reminded me of like that Birkin bag situation that happened not too long ago. And I look at all the comments. And, I, and the majority of the internet was like, who cares about a, a Birkin bag? But there's still people up there that are trying to live with the Joneses. Here's what it is. Do your thing in your own space. It's a hard one. The good black woman try to keep the house clean. Good black woman is clean by her own body. You know, a lot of those things we kind of take for granted, but all of our people don't know about that. There are people who are angry with me because I even describe the fact that some of us as sisters uh, don't have the proper personal hygiene as if that don't exist. We have too much falsehood and pretense going about our condition. Everybody just dressed up ain't clean. the truth. We have to look at our condition in the light of truth. Stop reacting emotionally and pretending that just because we don't want to dip. One of the most difficult things that I deal with out here is trying to teach our people the difference between an actual fact and an opinion. Our people think that they can accept or reject truth based on how they feel about it. Mm. Your feelings don't change the truth. Not a damn thing about the your feelings. The truth is just going to be there. You can feel yeah. any kind of way you want to feel about it. Any kind of way. Those are just those kind of emotions have kept us from growing. Oh. Because anything we don't like, we just reject that and say, well, I don't believe that. That I don't, don't mean that it's not the truth. It just makes you a disbeliever. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. The good black woman uh, practices non-possessive loving. Now, y'all know that's a hard one. Oh. <laughs> now, envy is wanting what someone else has. And jealousy, of course, is just selfishness. 
uh, non-possessive loving is not an easy one for us to practice. And uh, of course, I have a lot of sisters and some brothers who are in disagreement with me saying that. But the actual fact is that our men are outnumbered about five to one. And nature is going to require that the men take responsibility for more than one woman and her children. Most of our men have children by more than one woman anyway. So That's I don't true. know why that was such a surprise, allegedly, when I said that. <laughs> the black man has not been waiting on me to tell him he could have more than one woman. That's true. You know, I'm in agreement with the rest of y'all. I don't think he should do that, but I fail like you did. Mm. There are some things, perhaps, about the nature of our man that we have been given some definitions about that are not true. Oh. There are some things he can do that we call him a dog. We do not have the same capabilities as a man. That's a fact. I am not talking about fornication and adultery. That's something else. I'm talking about actual responsibility of fatherhood and husbandhood of another family. That's quite different from fornication and adultery. I, I, I hear her and the and the thing is is like I just I just don't see how it's how it's feasible to um have multiple families and then raise the children because you know there's only what twenty four hours in a day. Right? So like I, I hear this and I'm still I'm conflicted on this one because I'm thinking about my my own time, right? Like in having one family and what, what that would look like from a time perspective and it could be multiple children and like in that one family. But then another family with children, one, two, three, like, how do you, like, manage your time? So, I don't know. I don't know if, if I feel okay with the conclusion of the black man has done it for so long. It's not, they have not waited for me to tell them that. And then we talk about this concept of self-discipline. Right. To me, it's like, well, what just what are your goals? Right. Like if you want to be polygamous, be polygamous. Just let the people in your life know that you want to be in a, in a polyamorous relationship and kind of just go from there. Just make sure you structure your time appropriately, because that's not how I want to do with my time is just raising all of these chi all these children and um, or having all that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have children with like all of these different women, but is what it is to me it's about time and then also money because <laughs> the more that you have to provide and support for the more that you're going to be working and potentially on the hamster wheel of life almost done we don't have the same capabilities of them that's right a man can have two homes two sets of in-laws he can eat dinner at two houses two sets of children two garages two separate sets of friends attached to that woman he can have all of that we can't do that. We can't cook dinner at two houses. We can't sleep with one man four nights a week and another one three. Ain't no man gonna agree with that. We can't have one set of children. We leave in one place and go and stay in another place and take care of another set. It doesn't work for us. Now that does not mean that we can't have sex with more than one man. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just taking responsibility for your children. Now, certainly, every man can't take financial responsibility for all of his children. He can do something. But a man who is spending time with a child is going to do something for it. Because then they'll find out what we have since we've been taking care of them by ourselves. You don't like to always say, no, I can't do it. No, I ain't got it. So they, the children will make you get it up. You spend some time with it. You know, th that, that's an important thing. Uh, the effectiveness of the principles that I just described their usefulness has not diminished just because modern opinion has changed about them. There is not a black man in this room who does not still enjoy it if his woman bake him a cake. While our young daughters are being raised and taught that that's old style and that's out of fashion. We are not making those rules, somebody else is, and they're imposing them on us and making us think that we have to qualify under them. I tell the brothers, just like I tell the sisters, if you have a woman that you've been working with for months or years and uh, you can't get that woman to get in agreement with your program, then get rid of her and get another one. 
<laughs> and I tell the sisters the same thing. If you're with a man you can't agree with, don't make his life miserable. Get with a man you can agree with. But we spend too much time living in hell with each other. We spend too much time tearing each other down, trying to make the other person do different or function different. If you want somebody to change, first change yourself. We set the example. We are the teacher. We are the mother. We set the example. All right, guys. So listen, that's the end of the video. If you've made it all the way to the end, cool. <laughs> Welcome to the end of the video guys this is the type of video where if you're commenting you commented on a specific portion of the video leave some timestamps down below okay leave some timestamps leave your comments so i know what portion of the video that you're talking about um this is a pretty long one yeah let me know let me know guys if you guys want me to review kind of these longer more historical kind of videos right um a lot of these types of videos have not been seen for decades from the majority of people so i can bring them up here and then we can talk about it and then we can go from there interesting i, I low-key want to just just buy the book just to see all of the points right and then do a book review on it 30 years later and then also compare it to how similar the situations are of today guys also as well leave down below how much of what she's saying is relevant today i want to hear your thoughts I thought some of it was and some of it wasn't, but I want to talk with you guys down in the description box, but I want to talk with you guys down in the comment box down below. All right. Until next time, YouTube. Peace.